So good morning, and today we start another theme. It's a little bit overlapping in a way with minimal art, um, in that we're going to look at art that is very concerned with the environment of display. So it's part of a tendency that comes into being, I suppose, like minimal art, as some kind of fracture or contestation or deliberate breaking down of the purity of formalistic ways of thinking about art. So there's a, a moment where that kind of formalism just almost produced its own um, al alternative, you know. So various different things come from that. And pop art too is, was a reaction against that. So is it, I, I'm trying. To, I'm finding one kind of moment of fracture that so many different things come from that influence really the shape of art that we have today in many ways. So these are tendencies <coughs> that still continue. I'm start going to start off by looking at what you might call environmental art. Um, that is art that you know tends to use the landscape and. Uh, but it's already a continuum between those kind of projects and installation art, public art, which deal with more social space or even gallery space. Minimalism, yeah, it was concerned with the environment for art, but that tended to be the white cube space, the same white cube space that was inhabited by formalistic art that treated it as a non, a sort of neutral background and a kind of nun space. Uh, minimalism brought, made you aware of that space, but it tended not for the most part to move outside of the of gallery space. Neutral with its neutrality. But so many other artists wanted to engage with the wider world or bring things from the wider world into the to ga to the gallery space. That's something that a lot of installation art sees. You know, art is using ready-made materials from the world and bringing them into the gallery space. It's a tendency that you can trace back all the way to collage or to Duchamp's. Uh, ready-mades as well if you if you wanted to, to, to look at a, a lineage for all that. Other aspects, especially when we talk about environmental art, maybe other aspects come in such as environmentalism, concern for nature, uh, that could be one of the motivations for working out in the landscape. Um, sometimes it's a, a more social thing, it's about working with audiences, working with communities, or feeling that art has somehow got too detached from life, that somehow if you make art in, in public space that you're going to connect to a wider audience. Obviously that's not necessarily going to happen if you take some obscure modern and contemporary art and put it in a, in a wider public space. That doesn't automatically mean a wider public will be able to understand what's going on. But at least, if, you know, if you if you get out to where people are, that creates certain possibilities for for, for doing things. In that sense, it maybe has uh, parallels with things we'll consider in the next theme when I'm going to talk about performance art. Some of the early manifestations of performance art you could call happenings, or very much about involving the audience themselves, even. A bit in a sort of utopian way, breaking down the barriers between the artist and the audience, making everything one. Sometimes there are other factors that come into play, like working out in the landscape. It could be about making artworks on a much larger scale than you can within a gallery setting. Um, it could be to do, to do with site specificity. You know, There's some specific site that you want to engage with. It could be the physical properties of the site, it could be the, the history of that site, the cultural association. So site specificity could be a, a, a kind of to do with the actual topography or it could be a sort of cultural site specificity about, about taking art into a different cultural situation, cross-cultural experiences. 
Another factor that's at play, I think, is this desire to create artworks that can't be easily commodified. I think there's that there's a turn in that direction uh, away from the marketplace. I mean, one one factor there was, you know, it, the, the abstract expressionist generation. You could call it a kind of bohemian generation, whether all their art is is you know. A lot of them you know, didn't sell works of art until they were quite quite advanced in years anyway. It wasn't really a concern with um, commodities, but they they're sort of they were kind of sort of outsiders in that sense. But by the 1960s, a lot of the artists that you start to see coming to prominence are people who have jobs in art schools. You know, they they they're with making art within an academic environment. And that leads to a certain kind of tendency, and uh, it also gives them a certain kind of freedom from having to work in the marketplace. And then later in the late 1970s into the 80s, there's a big art market boom that happened. And you know, well, we're still in an era where art is very close, for the most part, to to the marketplace, and a lot of ambitious artists seem to really be concerned with. Um, uh, you know, their success in that sense, but uh, in this period, I think often there was a move to to create art that wouldn't fit those concerns. So it could be just that the, the creating something on such a scale that it can't be made into a commodity, or it could be you know the disappearance of the art object, making something that is not so physical. Yeah. Um, which were the artists in the twentieth century that really? played the market, if you were to say, like, a commercial artist, because I can think of Warhol, but yeah. which, if you were going to give a criticism to an artist for commerciality, who would be, like, the real leaders? Um, well, it's not necessarily, I mean, it, it's difficult to pin down, because if, if someone plays with the market, it may be because they just feel that's where the reality is, and you've got to deal with that reality just like if you're uh, making rock music uh, if you decided you weren't going to issue records with record companies it would be a pretty radical thing so you know you could still do a lot of good stuff but but still have your your records issued by a, a major label or something like that so it's not necessarily a kind of complete uh, saying that ah oh, that person is a sellout I, w I would think of someone like Jeff Koons would be a very good <laughs> example because he, he very consciously tries to kind of work with the marketplace and thinks about uh, promotion and so forth. But I think there was a, there was a really a big turn. Uh, part of the whole thing when w in the late 70s into the 80s you see this a movement back towards painting and towards a expressionism, sort of neo-expressionism. Um, so a lot of those artists are then are creating works that are much more amenable to the marketplace, uh, both in terms of being physical objects that you could buy and hang on your wall, but also in the sense of being more uh, less abstruse, you know, less intellectual uh, in in their their take. So that would be the whole gener generation um, uh, of, of that kind of neo neo expressionism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That's that, that generation. Yeah. Uh, but like I say, it's uh, it's complicated. It's not you can't just say they're a whole bunch of sellouts and what they do is of no importance. It's just I mean art has al just art has always had you know you could because you could say the same with Michelangelo. Yeah, we, he just painted that ceiling because the Pope was going to pay him to do it. Yeah, well, yes, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not uh, a value. You know, there's always an economic reality, and somehow you've got to come uh, to deal with it. And one thing is, you know, can you actually escape from it? You know, is there a space outside of the capitalist economy? You know, um, a lot of the artists who did very, um, you know, em environmental works, <coughs> in the end, their work comes back to to the. The, the marketplace through documentation, uh, the, then the docu documents become the commodities. Um, 
or if it doesn't become a com uh, commodity in that way, it becomes something that only the hyper rich can afford to get out to, to see, you know, because the, you need time to, to travel out into the countryside to, s to see these places. Most of us have daytime jobs, we can't afford the, the time for all that. So that become, you know, the Los, Los Angeles County Museum or something can ha have a plane and its sponsors can be flown out to, to, to look at the spiral jetty or some, something like that. But uh, it, you know, those kind of things go on. I can't remember the exact details, but that, that, that sort of story is a, uh, uh, has occurred. Um, so yeah, there's, there's that kind of com complication. Let, let's um, let's look at uh, an example. Then we can start to bring the, the these things down to specificities a bit. Uh, let's look at Christo and Jean Claude. Well, for a long time, these were thought of as the works of Christo. Uh, but at a certain point, his partner Jean Claude was given co-authorship of almost all of the works. Probably these very early works like this. Uh, belong to uh, to Christo uh, himself. Uh, it's not, um, you know, that's before their partnership really got going. Uh, so, yeah, he started off making things like this package in a shopping cart, 1964, or, or um, another example would be this, the, the wall of oil barrels, Iron Curtain, 1962. So um, where he sort of blocked a street with um, empty oil barrels. Most famous, I suppose, of course, for wrapping. <coughs> so wrapping starts off in the, on this small scale, but then becomes something that he does on a, a landscape scale. <coughs> and that wrapping, of course, has a kind of history veiling wrapping or just the notion of drapery could be you know clothing could be part of the kind of range of references that that come up here in contemporary art it has in modern art it has uh, meaning tied back to um, artworks by you know people such as Man Ray this is the Enigma of Isidore Duquesne 1920 or you could have um, Merritt Oppenheim's object of 1936, you know, teacup covered in fur. So something made strange, or, or Magritte even, Magritte's The Lovers, 1928, where two faces are hidden by being veiled in this way. <coughs> so these are all kind of precedents that are sort of out there in the air that kind of come to bear for uh, Christo's work. Uh, nothing comes from nothing, creating a, some sense of enigma. Art is supposed to be about what is visible, what you can see, generally, uh, but then this is bringing up that which is invisible, the kind of the hidden, um, then our imagination goes to work about what, what might be there. Christo himself, apart from these uh, these examples, Christo himself also mentions Rodin's sculpture of Balzac, where the final version show, shows Balzac uh, clothed, and uh, you know the body is almost completely hidden by the clothing, and Christo says that that's much better because it's more abstracted, all the details of anatomy are, are, are removed from the picture. Of course, with, the, with this work, blocking a street um, in this way, you could say it has political connotations because we think, of course, of, of street barricades in political protest. Um, blocking of flow, you know, there's like, for instance, there's a wonderful um, description of the building of a barricade 
in uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, when he talks about all the different objects that went into the barricade, and it's almost like a description of a of a, a, a work of um, you know um, of installation art, really, to all the different objects that have made made up uh, that thing. And then, fairly quickly, um, moving to quite large scale, this is one of the few works that they did that was not in the Western world. He's tended to work mostly in Europe and North America. Um, this one is in Australia, you know, wrapping a whole piece of coastline. Yeah, as I say, he, he's especially, they are especially well known for wrapping works, but that's only one aspect of what they, do, uh, what they do. Uh, Jean-Claude is, is no longer alive, so no, it's back to Christo working on his own. This is one of the most famous of his work, The Running Fence, he was saying 1972 to, to 76. very hard to capture a work like this through photographs because not just the sheer scale of it but just the how it would change in different times of day you know I mean one part of it would be like how the, the light changes it's a curtain um, that um, just covers over 24 miles 24.5 miles of, of Northern California, like a sort of deliberately temporary and flexible Great Wall of China or something like that. It sort of references those kind of big architectural structure, but it, in fact it's very flimsy and, 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 and temporary. The material, um, nylon panels, six meter high nylon panels, and 2,050 steel poles, what it's constructed of. Uh, and that uh, nylon material is actually the same material used for airbags in cars. And the reason it was available to him at a good price was that car manufacturers had sort of lobbied um, to prevent the introduction of safety legislation. So that, that technology, which is now very common in cars, was was opposed by the car manufacturers for a long time and so the material that had been produced for that function wasn't needed and he was able to use it. Um, very ecological in his thinking, um, the farmers got to keep the material uh, that was on their farm, uh, the bit that passed over their farm, so they like to do that re recycling, reusing, uh, and the land as well had to be made good. Um, so about two years of planning went into the whole thing uh, and that's that's not as long as sometimes was the case with their projects. So two years of planning for something that only lasted for 14 days. It's very 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 temporary. The most difficult part, perhaps, was the coastal bit, where it, go, it goes down into the sea. Uh, that was on land owned by the government, and that proved the most difficult. In the, in the end, they preempted the de delays by just going ahead and, and doing it without permission, and that ended up with a, a fine in due course as a result of that. A long, lot of preparation. So it, it's as much a um, a social process as anything else. Although it's it's looking at the photo, you see something that's in a, a landscape that's very bare and not particularly in, inhabited. Um, the process of, of making it uh, is is a very social process. You have to have meetings with the individual farmers and with the communities that might be affected to answer all their questions. So. There was an environmental impact report that was 450 pages long. You know, it's it's like some kind of made, like when your Hong Kong airport is considering a new runway and you have to have an environmental impact report. It's sort of thing you get for major infrastructural projects. 
you can see here in this photo how it's uh, there's a little gap where there's a, a road cross so there there are gaps from time to time for the roads there were 14 uh, roads that it, that it crossed and also gaps for the passage of livestock and so forth I think nearly 60 ranch families had to be dealt with there's also the authority so you know it all involves lawyers and everything and the question comes up um, to what extent it's about the end result and to what extent the process is the artwork you know a lot of artists start to think of the process as being being you know as important or, or being the artwork itself you know that could become something more performative um, and that could be something you, you, you might consider with a, a work like this certainly in terms of time it's the process is taking up the time so only 14 days that's pretty much a, a, a very transient um, artwork and that transience is although sometimes it's um, intrinsic in the sense that you know it would be hard to, to sustain one of these projects for very long actually I think to a large part that the transience is a chosen thing it becomes a sort of almost sort of fetishized uh, kind of concern with with transience um, even when something could have gone on for longer it, sometimes they deliberately keep a limit to it they don't allow these artworks to to live forever anyway that seems very important to their the whole project they pay for everything themselves uh, they never accept uh, sponsorship and you know uh, some of these projects will really cost millions of dollars so what they m they make from it all they they kind of in, uh, you know invest back in or you know cash all their chips out onto the next bet you know that we're moving from project to project and the whole idea there is about retaining some kind of autonomy um, this is particularly important for Christo because he grew up in Eastern Europe during the communist era where the state was really influential over art uh, so the idea of complete autonomy complete freedom is really important and so when he talks about this art he says you know that they have no the meaning his artwork they have no uh, other reason to them except poetical creativity total creativity that freedom is the most important part of this project and this is why they cannot stay because freedom is the enemy of possession and possession is equal to permanence so this is a very important idea of you know not letting the artwork becoming commodified. Of course, an artist can say something you know that 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 the meaning is this, uh, but that an artist can't control the meanings that uh, an artwork would be given. Other people have their say with that. So, in order to pay for these works without public money or sponsorship um, what they do is to sell the drawings that he makes the drawings are, are only his not not John Claude's um, and the drawings the drawings sort of feel like preparatory drawings they have a look of being preparatory drawings but in fact they're they're mostly made made for sale really I mean they're not actual they're not the drawings that he really needs to make in order to think through the project so they're sort of ancillary works related to the project so uh, I find there's a sort of slightly funny thing where the the drawings live forever and they are completely commercial you know they exist to, to make money in order to create an artwork that is completely free from commercial constraints can't be bought and wasn't wasn't sponsored but there's a sort of uh, you know aw awkward sort of division of their oeuvre into two between the free things and the completely marketplace orientated things and 
to me, it, it would be slightly funny to, to buy one of those works of art that was made, made for sale in that way. Um, so a lot of people have helped them putting up the, 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 the different works, such as, such as this, this one, The Running Fence. Um, they may be volunteers, but they're also you know, paid workers. But they're never collaborators. They're, 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 they're only following the instructions of Christo and, and Jean Claude. So the creativity is something that they are, you know, claiming. They're not ship. They're not interested to share creativity with a with a, uh, a large number of people, which you could imagine some people might might consider uh, an important thing to do. So, so art, but it, it also, you know, because of the time scale and the, the physical scale, uh, it also starts to, to feel like a, uh, you can compare it with architectural projects of some kind, and city planning projects and so forth. Those seem to be the kind of analogies, um, you know, really, um, quite different. You could know, think of it as a drawing if you want a very, very long line, something like that, one way of thinking about it. Valley Curtain, 1972. Well, here's an example of one of the, the drawings and plans. So the sort of commodity through which the work could be, could be uh, can live on. They have a really nice website. It's a really well de designed website with uh, all their projects on it. I would recommend you to have a look at that. This came down really soon, you know, because there were pro problems with the, the wind. Actually, they, bo for both Running Fence and Valley Curtain, there are movies you can watch ab ab about it. Here he's sort of damming a kind of valley, if you want to think of it that way. This big sort of sail of fabric across across a valley. There's a little kind of hole that you can get through at ground level by the road. So changing the look of the whole landscape. Working on this scale, you could also try and relate it to notions of the sublime. You know, the, the kind of vast landscapes that nineteenth-century nineteenth-century uh, American painters like Biestat uh, like like to paint. So this is uh, working with the actual landscape itself, of course. Yeah, here here it is. It's the view from the other side, I think. This is one where I think the idea came more from Jean-Claude. Sur Surrounded Islands, 1980 to 83 was the working period. 83 is the actualization time. So done on little islands uh, off uh, in Florida, off the coast of Florida. Creating a kind of skirt for, for those islands blocking them off from, from direct access. Pink against the blue. One of the European projects is the Pont Neuf. Here, it, you, have the, the, you know, the sort of pleating of it has a feel almost like drapery, almost like clothing. It's a relatively light material compared to that he used, say, unlike the one I'll show you in a minute, the Reichstag had a, a kind of heavier material to it. This was uh, the oldest surviving bridge in Paris. So I think deliberately choosing something that is, that is called the new bridge, but it's, a very, it's the oldest bridge. He 
says, Christo, when the Pont Neuf was realised, it was an abstraction of a bridge, and all around things looked very trivial and banal. Only the essence of, of the proportion was left. This is a, depending on how you look at it, you, the, the Umbrellas project could be seen as a, a really massive work of, work of art because one part of it was in California and one part of it was in Japan. So, you know, if you want to think of all the space in between as being part of the artwork too, then it, that makes it very large and really impossible for anyone to take it all in in one time. Two continents. So the the blue is the is the Japanese one, and the the yellow is the Californian one. And there were technical difficulties about the wind picking up the umbrellas and so forth. Each is six meters high and nine meters across, so yeah, quite large in scale. And one of the most famous of their project, the Reichstag building, that's the parliament, currently the parliament building, and well, originally it was and it is again the parliament building of Germany. Um, I think this is actually almost an odd one out in a way and being so uh, inevitably political you know because of the history of the Reichstag as a kind, kind of um, key building of the Nazi era Germany then as a country with a very you know well a raw, still raw memory, I would say, of because uh, it's still within living memory, the Nazi era for older, older people. Uh, uh, some countries can think of themselves in a very positive way about their history, but if you're German, that's not an option for you. You've got to acknowledge that we were the bad guys. You know that uh, our country was the bad guy. And how do you deal with that sense of your own history, the complicated nature of your own history? Um, the past and the traumas that took place there. So it, it's in Berlin. And Berlin, up until the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, of course, was a city divided. It was, it was sort of separate, really, from the rest of West Germany, a little island within East Germany, because it had been the, the capital city of Germany before. Um, and it had this special status where it was broken down into zones. There was an American zone, a British zone, a French zone, and a Russian zone because of the armies that um, of the countries that took you know, took it during the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War. And the Reichstag building itself was was the only bit that wasn't in one of those four sectors. It was a kind of under joint control because of its special status. So this is a, a project that began a long time before the fall of the Berlin Wall and German reunification. Uh, has a, a low. It was actualized after the, those things, so the meaning sort of shifts over time. So I think o over twenty years, about twenty-three years, uh, the whole process took, and inevitably it was very politicized. It was turned down explicitly at three times: nineteen seventy-seven, nineteen eighty-one, nineteen eighty-seven, and it got. It did get support from West German. Prime Minister Willy Brandt. Um, you could say because Christo had had grown up in the Eastern Bloc, he had a special interest in these sort of East-West uh, relations. You know, Berlin is a city where East meets West. You could say, in term political terms, capitalism and communism. Um, so. 
I think it was only after the end of the Cold War that the that it was possible to actualize it, and of course the meanings had shifted then. The Russians had been worried before that um, that that uh, the Reichstag could become a kind of focus for German reunification politics, you know, in the period before. So all sorts of things happened, like there was a debate in the German parliament about it, televised live, live a kind of hour and a half debate, so art getting caught up in you know, the details of political life. Physically, it's 60 tons of fabric, very thick fabric compared to the, uh, the Pont Neuf. So, uh, you know, veiling and then, I suppose it's the unveiling afterwards also is part of the meaning in a way. It's not just the, the veiling, it's the unveiling. It's the, again, that goes down to the temporiness of it as being important. You're drawing attention to the past, even if you are doing it by a kind of hiding of a building. But it's somehow meant to help you move beyond the past. That building has since been, you know, rebuilt. It's got additions by Norman Foster on the roof and so forth. So it's not just Christo who feels it's a kind of key site for the new unified Germany. Okay, moving on to some other artists who worked in with the environment. Michael Heiser would be a, a good example. Uh, this is his double negative, 1969 to 70. Massive kind of earthworking effort. It, it's actually on a sort of a misa, a kind of raised um, you know, geological for formation. And in the Nevada desert, the United States. And what he's done is make uh, a cut into the two, two s sides of, 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 of it, you know, so that they, the two, the two cuts sort of speak to each other across a naturally occurring valley area between them. So some, some geometric form on top of the, the natural forms. Two slots cut, cut 12 meters deep to the top of facing sections of a mesa. So a line but separated by this ravine. He didn't bring any material to the site to make the artwork. He, he just subtracted material from the site to make the artwork. So, you know, it's just uh, made, it's made of the site, not in the site, you could say, or not just in the site. And needed two tons of dynamite to remove 200,000 tons of rock. His grandfather had been a mining engineer and his father had been an archaeologist. So the, there's, there's this sort of family tradition of intervening in different ways with the, the landscape. Very different, I suppose, from the crystal because it's a sort of totally a social project. There's no one he has to negotiate with except, I suppose, whoever owned the land before. But um, you know, it, 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 it's not about uh, engaging with the community the way the Reichstag project would be. It's about sort of engaging with with, with nature, and it's the kind of it's kind of the kind of like large scale engagement that sometimes you see in primitive um, marks left on the, the, the landscape in Peru and things like that. Those kind of um, fairly mysterious. Uh, interactions with the, the landscape. Now it's deteriorating a little bit, although it seems so monumental. Uh, in fact, it, it's subject to erosion and so forth. And initially his idea was to just to leave it as it was and let it, whatever happened, happen. But then he seemed to have changed his mind at a later point and now says he wants to see it preserved. Yeah, that's the view from down inside. Hmm. 
most famous work by Robert Smithson, Spiral Jetty in 1970. Just taking uh, the materials to, to a, a lake and uh, creating a jetty, but a jetty that is in a spiral shape. And apparently he chose this site because it was a very non-pastoral kind of site. So it was a kind of part of nature that was very despoiled. You know, it was a place where uh, materials were being dumped and things like that. The landscape had been kind of basically raped already. It wasn't a kind of pure, uh, unspoilt or farmland or wild nature or anything like that. And he liked to, to be engaging with, with such a space. It, over its history, it, it has changed quite a lot. Um, the color can, can change. There are algae in the water that apparently, you know, the, the, the lake is, uh, it's the Great Salt Lake, so as the name suggests, it's a very high salinity, but there's some algae live here that can um, deal with high salinity. Uh, and, and that may also be partly why he chose the site here. You, you get this kind of bright red color sometimes of the algae. But all that, because that's an organic process, that can change over time. But the other thing that changes over time is the water level. The water level can go up and down depending on different factors. Um, so, yeah, here it looks like, in this photo, it looks like a jetty, but sometimes it, the whole thing is submerged. For quite a long period it was submerged, in fact. Maybe you, maybe you could see it under the water, but it, it was underwater. And then the most recent um, information I have about it is that now the water levels have receded quite a lot. So it's not surrounded by water at all, it's surrounded by um, just a, a kind of dried uh, sort of salt pan, if you like, kind of dried out uh, salt as the water has, got, has gone further back. So then it's largely kind of white rather than, uh, at other times it could be quite red. Of course, again, you have different times of day where, where the light would be different and so forth. It's now owned by the Dia Art Foundation in New York, non-profit art foundation. It was donated after his death by his uh, wid widow. Well, the Heiser piece is, I think, owned by um, by a museum in LA. I'm, I think it might be the LA Mocha Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. Yeah, it's just to show how it can look quite different at different times. Yeah, that's a submerged view. Yeah, I guess I guess so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know for sure, but I think it's a pretty good guess. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know where. Um, asphalt runoff. Another Smith uh, rundown. Sorry, another Smith and work from 1969, a year earlier, in fact. I I would say you know this is one of the many many examples you, you can come up with of artists who are engaging with Jackson Pollock you know uh, pouring instead of pouring paint onto a canvas you're pouring asphalt down a, a slope you know taking it to a but it, it, this is the, exactly the kind of sites that uh, Six and that that Smithson was interested in these kind of nun sites these kind of uh, Know, damaged and used up kind of landscape uh, and making a temporary intervention in it. 
rejecting the pastoral. That's not the world we're living in, is what he, he's saying. He, he's kind of interested in it, the dialogue between what you can do in the landscape and what you can do in the gallery. So he also has uh, works like this sandstone with mirror in 1969, where he's bringing mat material from those kind of sites into a gallery setting. Site, non-site, indoor, outdoor. He has a lot to say about his own work, you know. A lot of writing. Yeah, this is a similar kind of idea. Double non-site. California and Nevada, bringing in material from different places. Richard Long, A Line Made by Walking, 1967. I mean, a lot of these artists, they, their work can fit into different categories. So I could, you could look at this as performance, if you like, as the title tells you, it was an activity that made it, it's a sort of process but it's also an end result, and it's an end result that's in a, a kind of landsc landscape setting. Yeah. If you want to see the the running fence as a line, you can certainly see this as a line because the artist tells you you can do so. A temporary intervention. Of course, the grass will soon grow back again that he's walked walked down. This would be a little bit more permanent. A line in Ireland, 1974. I think his sensibility is very different from someone like Smithson. It's much more of a, a romantic sensibility, you know, going out to a beautiful remote location and then you create an artwork. It's almost a sort of meditative, finding a way to have a kind of meditative engagement with nature, a, a gentle one that is not going to uh, disturb the the purity of the, the landscape it just leaves you some sense that you you were there it's completely different from bringing big trucks of material like Smithson did you know had a, a construction expert to help him or using dynamite to make a big hole in the, the landscape this is deliberately very minimal and you 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 know again there's this question of well okay this is fine but who gets to see it uh, not just the question of who gets to see it but how, how am I going to make a living from do it, doing this how am I going to pay to go for my next holiday in <laughs> Ireland to make my next uh, line in, the, in, in Ireland so uh, yeah the photos and um, you know maps that show walks he did that's a certain kind of thing that he does but he also has equivalents that he produces in uh, gallery settings like one thing is using mud to make uh, spattered circles on gallery walls uh, again it's Jackson Pollock uh, you know haunting uh, artists that come after him I, th I think really it's a little bit like some Indian sand painting and those kind of precedents too Yeah, here's an example of a stone circle from 1976. He's done that very often in gallery settings, as well as the mud handprint works. He's also done these uh, bringing bringing in materials and making again working on the ground. It's yeah, it reminds me of um, the interest in materials that you get with Carl Andre. Say so, it's not that far away from that. Walter de Maria, Lightning Field, 1976. What, 76, 77? Just these poles um, installed in a, a part of the New Mexican landscape wilderness area that is prone to lightning. The title makes you think of lightning but, um, and sometimes the poles will be uh, hit by lightning strikes, obviously they would attract them, uh, but it's not just about the lightning. So, so you could be going there and not seeing any lightning and still you'd be getting the effect of the work.
It's also about the changing of the light through the day and everything, very meditative kind of work. Um, so steel poles are over a, a mile by a kilometer, evenly spaced. The lengths of the poles vary depending on, um, you know, the, the terrain is, is not completely flat. So all the poles come up to the same height, so some have to be longer to do that. It takes about two hours apparently to walk the perimeter of, of the whole field. Timaria says, the land is not the setting for the work, but a part of the work. It is intended that the work be viewed alone or in the company of a very small number of people over at least a 24-hour period. So that's to encourage this sort of meditative uh, ap approach. And indeed, I think that's what you have to do. You have to book to, to, to stay there and, and, and nearby simple accommodation and only a small number of people can stay in the cabin or whatever it is for uh, for one viewing period and you have to be there till the next day so it's, it's a almost like a, a meditation retreat or something like that, that you're you're signing up for and the whole idea of lightning it, it must have this idea of linking between uh, earth and sky, you know, that, that has a sense of uh, above and below, heaven and earth. But here is uh, examples where there is actual lightning. Vertical earth kilometer. Well, it's a, a, a a metal rod that's a, uh, a kilometer long buried under the ground. So what you see here is just the end of that rod showing, showing through. Uh, so it's a kind of a, a hidden artwork, you could say. And uh, an indoor version of the earth. Uh, yeah, please go if you Sorry, have to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a question for the exam on in a week. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to look over the images, but a lot of the um, ones that you've listed, when I type them into the internet, like either the wrong one pops up or. Okay. Where, where are you? Where are you looking for them? <coughs> Just Google. Oh well, what you should do is go to the Art Favor site. You know the other Fine Arts Department Favor site, and then all the images should be there. Oh. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry, I should r remind you that. But the, the people who've been here for their whole study kind of know it. I should have uh -huh. said that. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. I will look for that. Yeah. Do you have the link? Can you show me? Yeah, yeah, I'll send you the link. I, I, I'll just carry, if you don't mind, if people who uh, don't have to leave, I, I would just carry on for a minute or two to finish looking at the environmental art theme. Yeah, so this is just a room filled with earth. If you have a chance to to see it, then, I mean, the smell is also a kind of earthy smell, you know, kind of bringing a landscape into uh, an interior. The whole room is just filled with earth up to sort of about two to three feet high, and you can look into it. You can't go into it. It's just a funny thing to encounter in the middle of New York City. Um, I've just finished with Goldsworthy, a British artist, torn piece, 1986. So his interventions are very tiny. I'm sort of contrasting his very, um, you know, deliberately subtle interventions in nature with the massive transformations of someone like Smithson. So concern with ecology, harmony with nature, and again, you know, this theme of transience. For him, the pho photographs are very important. It's almost, sometimes the works only exist from the particular vantage point of the photo. So the photos aren't just kind of documentation, they almost complete the work itself. So yeah, for example, like this, this work, um, it works in the photo from that particular viewpoint this being Ice Peace, 
uh, was just in very cold weather. I suppose he, he must have used a bit of water to join the pieces together and then it froze. I presume he did it on the flat and then carefully <laughs> raised it up. So very fragile. I mean, the fragility is all a part of it, isn't it? You know? And this is the larger scale project that uh, he did compared to those very tiny ones, Snowballs in Summer, 88 to 89. In the middle of winter in Scotland, he created these big snowballs, uh, rolling the snow until it gathers into a large ball and some picks up s sticks and leaves and whatever happens to be there in the natural environment. And then he put it in cold storage until the following summer and on midsummer day in the middle of London suddenly put all the, the snowballs out again uh, and then just left them there to, to, to melt. And as you see there are different objects in, that were naturally had become embedded in the uh, so in a, the heat of summer and because they're so big actually they would take quite a while to, to melt. Yes. Ground. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so so they they were all, all in you know oh. different parts of the city, oh. you know I mean places like this like a public park where everyone has access but it's not going to block the. Some are actually in the streets as well. Mm. There was quite a good website, but I don't. Uh, I just had a quick look before the class and I couldn't find it. Uh, but m maybe it's moved. But it's the kind of thing where a lot of people produce their own documentation, you know, of, of, of what, what they saw. And I say it's partly about, you know, Link reminding you of winter and summer and all that, but it's also reminding city people of the countryside, you know, linking different worlds. Okay, uh, sorry, we better stop now. <laughs>